I am so excited to start this episode again there with Gaz with some amazing news. If you've been listening to my career here in the Capital Region, you know about the partnership we've been able to have with Mohawk Honda, the great people at Mohawk Honda. And now I'm proud to say Mohawk Honda has partnered with Godzilla Media. Across all nine podcasts here on Godzilla Media, you'll find out more about the great people, the great service in Mohawk Honda, where they go out of their way to please you. I've been driving around my pilot here in the Capital Region. I had to make an upgrade as the baby was on the way. Luckily, the great staff there in Mohawk Honda took care of me to go through that entire thing. Whether it's John of the Service Department, whether it's Cam McKenna who helped me get into the vehicle, Greg and Andy, Lindsay, everybody at Mohawk Honda has helped me change my life in a positive way. The change came. Baby boy, you got to be safe. You got to get that upgrade in the vehicle. And I've loved the pilot by far and away the best vehicle I've ever had in my life. Go today. Stop over to Mohawk Honda in Glenville. And we're going to continue to share more great stories about the Mohawk family so you can continue to find your ride in the Capital Region. If you're listening outside Albany, drive in. That's how great the service, the selection of vehicles is at Mohawk Honda. We are so proud to have them a part of Gonzalo Media. And we're so thankful that we continue to talk about a great business like Mohawk Honda. So now on to this week's episode, Mark has to share getting there with Gaz. Another episode here of Getting There with Gaz, talking about the career paths, the journeys of media members, coaches, athletes, business owners, and more. Capital Region fans know this guy. You can see it on our YouTube side right now. He is ESPN's own Mark Kestesher. We're going to find out how that four letters got in front of his name through his career path. But let's start at the beginning. Kesty, six, seven, eight years old. Where did you grow up? What did you want to be as a kid? And was it that same job you wanted when you were 18 years old? Guys, good to be with you. And uh, yes, yeah, six, seven, eight years old, I was in Liberty, New York in the Catskills. Um, I was there uh, from my birth until about 1976. So right about eight years old. That's when my, uh, my dad, who had opened up a clothing store in Stuyvesant Plaza, moved the whole family up to Albany. Uh, we settled in Gilderland. I uh, was in Gilderland High School from third grade right to the end. Uh, till 12th before going to Syracuse. And I'd say at about maybe 13 or 14 years old, I mean, I always was hit with the sports bug, but I really got hit uh, over the head by the Yankees. There was something about the Yankees, obviously 77 and 78, right in my wheelhouse as a 10-year-old with back-to-back -back championships. But it was something more than that. Like I had to watch every pitch, every inning. And back then, you know, most of the games weren't on television. So I would listen to the radio and you'd hear, you know, Phil Rizzuto and Bill Messer and or uh, Bill White, uh, you know, call these games from Frank Messer. And it was magical. And uh, where I grew up in Gilderland, we had a raised ranch and I was the only person in the downstairs area. So my parents had no idea what was going on. I'm <laughs> up, you know, West Coast games with a radio till one in the morning. And I know the alarm's going off at five, you know, to get ready for school. But I was just so fascinated by the medium that that's what I wanted to do. But I didn't really think it was an actual job. And uh, and I was really good in school at math and science. So I went to Syracuse for uh, chemical engineering. I got into the, uh, yeah, the, the engineering school at Syracuse just by chance. I mean, I loved, you know, Syracuse sports, uh, but I still, you know, even though I knew Newhouse was there, the communication school, that was never really on my uh, radar until I realized uh, chemical engineering after two years was, uh, I, I didn't have the uh, aptitude to get through it for four. I was spending too much time at the Carrier Dome. I was having too much fun. And then I, it just kind of came back around that, you know what I'd really like to do? And so I was so far behind as a junior in college to catch up. And it's miraculous that I'm here today to tell you about my story and th that four-letter network that I've been working for for the last 20 plus years. But that's how it all began uh, in Gilderland, New York, just with a dream and a transistor radio. You know, there's engineering schools here in the Capital Region you could have easily attended, easily in the sense of closer to the house rather than going two hours west. You, you could have stayed closer if you wanted to be an engineer. I know, and, and, and RPI was right in my wheelhouse. They won a championship, right, right in the middle 80s, 1985. So, you know, I, I thought of myself as a good student, but I'm not sure if I was good enough, even in engineering, um, you know, maybe to crack some of the top engineering schools in the Capital Region. But I have to say, there was a friend of mine uh, we were in the same class at Gilderland, and his sister was the manager of the basketball team. 
And one day he said, where are you going to look for colleges? And I said, well, I'm going to drive to Rochester. I'll see, you know, RIT, University of Rochester, good engineering schools. And um, he said, well, why don't you come to Syracuse with me? And so I, uh, I'd like to say I dialed up Syracuse on the internet. That didn't exist. So <laughs> I, went, I went to the library and found out that Syracuse University had an engineering school. And so I drove out with him. Uh, those were different times, you know, where, uh, you know, I had a car and I was 17 years old and my parents weren't with me. I went and did my own college interviews. And so I remember uh, this uh, this guy's sister taking us inside the Carrier Dome into the locker rooms um, and walking on that campus. And I just knew I, I, I kind of had a feeling sports was where I wanted to go, but it just didn't seem real at the time. I just instinctively knew this is going to be the place for me. So uh, I think I needed to be about two and a half hours away from home to kind of make that leap as an 18 year old uh, kind of into my own, uh, into my own man, I guess you would say. Yeah. I've spoken to some of your fellow past Syracuse alumni, and this is usually a part of the interview for the Syracuse graduates, where we talk about the steps in a new house and what happens in the competition and everything else. But I think it's safe to say that your career move is more kind of like a non-traditional college setting because a lot of your opportunities, as you mentioned, you're transitioning back into sports, which is your passion, but you're doing things with the Albany Patroons in local capital region sports teams to find your experience rather than being on the call for the Syracuse athletic programs. Yeah, I mean, I, I might have the most non-traditional path of many. Now, I've worked with Dan Schulman for many years, and as great of an announcer he is, he too didn't do the traditional broadcast upbringing in college. I think uh, he had a very math and science background, and you know that's a whole other story. But for me, here I am, a junior, um, realizing I need to go in a completely different direction. And I remember that summer before my junior year, so I'm going back to Syracuse, um, in the summer of 1988. And I went to Heritage Park to go see the Albany Colony Yankees with the express consent. I don't say consent, the express written consent to uh, <laughs> go find the late Rip Rowan, who was the, you know, the uh, sports at six and 11 for years and years and years in my growing up years at Channel 10. And now he was in charge of the uh, AC Yankees. And I found him Somewhere in the seventh inning, he was walking along the first base concourse, and I just made a beeline for him. And I said, Mr. Rowan, I introduced myself, student at Syracuse University, interested in being a broadcaster, and I want to be your intern next summer. And so he, I gave him my phone number. Um, you know, it was a very friendly conversation. It was very short. I, I might have spoke to him for 30 seconds, and I never thought about it again. I said, well... That was my shot. You know, I'll have to find a different path into into sports as an internship. And then I remember being back on campus at Syracuse a couple months later. It was late October. And, um, you know, for the kids out there, there was this machine that had a blinking red light. And that was the answering machine connected <laughs> to a landline telephone. And I, I press play. And lo and behold, there's the great voice of Rip Rowan saying, Mark. We'd love to have you as our intern, you know, follow up with uh, the people at Syracuse University and their internship program. Send something to me. We'll see if we can make it happen. So long story endless, I end up getting that internship uh, the summer between my junior and senior years at Syracuse. And uh, I worked with Dale McConaughey, who was the voice uh, for that year. He had come uh, from uh, a double A baseball job in the Minnesota Twins organization. And so he's working with us. And he also got the Albany Patroons job. So he was going to be the Patroons announcer that fall. I was getting ready to go back to Syracuse that fall. And I was doing the, uh, the math and science part of it and realized I'm probably on the six or seven year program right now. And I'm not going to put my parents financially through that. So I wiggled away to leave Syracuse. I enrolled in some classes at the University of Albany. And I was working for the Albany Patroons selling advertising for their radio. And I was also getting some on-air work as the analyst sometimes, or maybe a pregame host. Uh, so anyway, fast forward to Christmas of 1989, which is a couple months after that. And Dale gets the job with the AAA Minnesota Twins in Portland, Oregon. And he has to leave the Patroons at that moment. And so Gary Holly, Joe Hennessy, who were involved in the Patroons, needed an announcer for a couple of weeks. And they looked at me and they said, do you have a tape? And fortunately, at every stop, whether I'm at Syracuse, whether I'm uh, in, you know, with the Patroons, I would always take a few minutes to go sit in the crowd with a microphone and a cassette deck and record a few minutes. And so uh, afterwards, they asked, 
did you watch that like off of VHS or was that live? And I said, no, that was live. And they said, all right, well, you get two weeks and four games. And next thing I know, I'm in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, calling uh, John Starks was on the Cedar Rapids team against the Albany Patroons. And after those four games, they kept me and the rest was history. I never ended up graduating from college. I said, I will go back to school when the jobs run out. And it went from the Patroons to just about every minor league team in Albany to a studio job in Albany, to a studio job in Cleveland, Ohio, to a studio job at ESPN, and then eventually working my way back into a play-by-play. -play. So yes, that is about as unconventional as it gets uh, for a broadcast uh, broadcaster from Syracuse. Yes, when you read that Mark Kestetcher bio on certain websites, that keyword there is attended, not graduated. Remember, he turned pro. You know, it's like LeBron and Kevin Garnett and all these other guys who skipped a college route. You got a cup of coffee in college for a few years. You've heard the, the career path and everything else. But it says attended, and there's nothing wrong with that. Again, you got the opportunity just at a younger age to start to advance your broadcasting career. So many people, I think, would do the same thing you did at that point, that I'm given these opportunities, and if I ever have to go back and get my degree, I will. But until then, I'm going to enjoy the ride, and no one's told you to get off that ride quite yet. It's so true. Yeah. Look, it, was, it was three very important years for me. I mean, those were three great growth years. I learned a ton, even though I didn't get it focused enough for an actual degree. Uh, but, you know, I, I learned a ton in math and science for two years. Um, I was in all, um, you know, the, the early um, classes that you would be in to go to Newhouse, but I just didn't put it all together. And, you know, I look at the price of college now and it's maybe four times what it was in the late 80s, but it still was very expensive back then, you know, for my dad. And I just, I just knew, I said, I think I'm going to have to start at the ground level here and I don't want to put you in any further debt. I was very fortunate that he even paid for my education in the first place. And, you know, to be honest with you, I felt very guilty for about 10 years and my sister was one year behind me. So she graduated from college in 1991. And I always felt like the black sheep of the family. And then fast forward 10 years and I got the job at ESPN. And there was never any, there was never anything from my parents that they were disappointed in me. I never heard any of that. It was really all on me psychologically. And so it, it took me to get to ESPN where I found that value that everybody has their path a little bit differently. And mine uh, was quite different. Yeah, as we forged through that path there, for you, the Albany Patroons is that start, but the Patroons season, there is some missing time in between. They do take a break. They have to move on. You also, at this point, are a part of the Albany Firebirds, and there's also an opportunity here in the Capital Region locally with WPTR Radio? Yeah, the, um, the Firebirds started in 1990, which coincided with my first year. So I do that first year of the Patroons where I take over for Dale, and then the owner of the Patroons, the owners, um, have an, uh, an AFL team in the Arena League. So uh, we weren't doing home radio at the time, but they hired me to do the road radio. I think I was also uh, playing music in the arena for home games. So when there'd be a touchdown, I'd have the old eight track, those carts, and I'd jam it in there and, and play it. And so it was, it was just a ton of fun. And that led also to a USBL team I did one summer, the Empire State Stallions, who I think played up at the uh, Glens Falls Civic Center. Um, I did some St. Rose basketball. I did University at Albany basketball with, you know, Roger Wyland. And I always had my little hands in there as far as, you know, getting as many different opportunities there was to broadcast games. I didn't realize it at the time. Then I was just really grasping for jobs. But as it turned out, it was part of your 10,000 hours to get ready for something bigger down the line. And the WPTR job, uh, Doug Sherman, who everybody knows, obviously from Channel 6 and now at ESPN, that was his job. He was the sports reporter, and he was doing Siena College basketball as well. So when he left for Syracuse in a AAA baseball job, I went after his old job, not only hoping that I would you know, get the job as the sports director, but maybe I could also call Siena basketball. And I think the year I signed on, Siena went to a different station. But it was still important because I didn't have that uh, complete – uh, opportunity to go day in, day out as a studio uh, writer and deliverer of news. And those two or three years that I worked at WPTR and then to WROW were incredibly important because while I wasn't able to get interviews for NBA jobs or Major League Baseball jobs, it did get me a critical interview at WKNR in Cleveland. And that brought me into a bigger market with major league teams and obviously springboarded me uh, three years later onto ESPN. So everything just kind of had a purpose. 
and all fell into place. Yeah, let's sit on this Cleveland story because even you retelling this story, as exciting as this is, you are a Gilderling kid. You are working in your hometown market. You're in your early 20s, progressing closer and closer to your 30s, but you're making a living doing what you want, and that's broadcasting and talking about sports. What you've wanted to do as a kid, it's happening right now in your hometown market. How does this Cleveland thing happen? And is it just the market size that makes you interested in leaving your hometown and chasing after this? You know, I don't know if I really wanted to leave Albany. I'd, I'd met my wife uh, after a Firebirds game in 1991. Her entire family is from the Gloversville area and she has three sisters. So, you know, for me to move away, you know, wasn't really something I was looking for. And you know, I was enjoying my time. I loved the Firebirds. I never wanted to leave that opportunity. I, as I said, I was doing university at Albany at the time as well. Um, and, you know, that it was it was satisfying me. I was perfectly satisfied. And again, pre-internet, this is right actually right around when internet was starting. Radio and Records, though, was still a magazine that you would buy. And in the back, they had all of the jobs. And one day, I'm just looking and something caught my eye. It was the logo of Sports Radio WKNR. And I looked a little closer and it said flagship of the Cleveland Indians and the Cleveland Browns. They hadn't left yet. They were just about to leave uh, for Baltimore. And so they were looking for an anchor, an update anchor and an occasional backup uh, talk show host. And so I just like I had done for many other jobs for play by play opportunities. I put together a, a reel on cassette. I mailed it to Cleveland. And much like my Rip Rowan story, I never thought about it again. And then six months later, out of the blue. I got a phone call from a gentleman uh, who was running that station, WKNR. He said, we want to fly you to Cleveland. We want to put you through an audition. And uh, next thing I knew, I, I had a plane ticket. You know, I went to Cleveland. They took me out to lunch. They brought me to the studio. They said, you know, write some updates, record them, whatever. And I went home and about a week later, they offered the job. And I asked my wife if she was ready for, uh, you know, an adventure. And if she said no, I probably would have turned it down. But she was ready to get out there, try something different. And we packed up the apartment. I think we packed up the cat and uh, I put the car on a hitch and boom, we took the U-Haul and we were out in Ohio about two weeks later. Amazing story. And as crazy as that sounds, I put what's going to happen next is what I call the myth of the capital region. There were three myths that I've heard through the great fight if it's actually really true or not. Two have confirmed. Uh, Freddie Coleman, who I'm going to talk to hopefully later on this summer, the way he got to ESPN was that somebody was driving through and heard him on the air, and that's how they heard him and everything else. Andrew Catalog confirmed to me, who's over at CBS now, that he was doing curling in Saratoga, and he worked his way up through that. The Mark Kestenshire myth, tell me if this is true or not. It's just out there in the world. When you were doing an update on Cleveland anchoring one day, somebody from ESPN was just randomly listening to you one day, and that was the break? Is, is this true? It's even better than that because uh, <laughs> Greg Brinda, who was uh, one of the talk show hosts at WKNR, got hired to do an occasional weekend on uh, game night on ESPN Radio, which back then that was huge. When you were on those Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights from 6 p.m. to 1 a.m. with Tony Bruno and Chuck Wilson and, you know, Keith Olbermann was on sometimes and Todd Wright, you know, that was a huge break. And so one of his trips back, I said, you know, I'm not that kind of guy that's like, hey, can you do something for me? But I said, here's a cassette with my updates from Cleveland. If you have the opportunity, please give it to the program director. So he did. And again, same story with Rip Rowan, with the WKNR. Many months go by. I hear nothing. So I forget about it. And then one day he's out there again for a weekend. He does his Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But his deal, Greg Brenda, was that he had to do his Monday morning Cleveland show from the ESPN radio studios back to Cleveland. So uh, the guy who's in charge of ESPN Radio at the time, Len Weiner, happens to be in early in the morning on Monday. He goes just casually to say hi to Greg and during one of his breaks. And like many of us broadcasters, when you take your headphones off, it's like on 10 because we're deaf after all these years of working <laughs> headphones. So it's basically a speaker. And my update from Cleveland is now coming through his headphones that are on the desk. And the boss at ESPN says, hey, who's that? And he goes, don't you remember the tape I gave you about four months ago? And so from him just happening to pass by the studio, hearing me on the air, he goes back. I don't even think he listened to the tape. He just got my number and calls me. And same deal says, we'd like to bring you out for an audition. And let's, pa let's fast forward a few years after that. I'm working at ESPN Radio. Len Weiner is now leaving us 
to go to another opportunity. And so he's emptying out his office and at the bottom of a box in the back of a closet with, you know, cobwebs all over it is my tape at the bottom. <laughs> he's like, hey, here's that tape I never heard. And he chucked it to me. And I think I have it somewhere in the house. So what ESPN calls, okay, that is better than the myth. I'm glad I get the real version of that because what I've heard is not like that. And I'm glad that's the real version. It's an even more ridiculous when you hear it. So when ESPN actually calls you, is it a is it a play-by-play opportunity? Is it an anchoring? What is the actual opportunity that they are presenting to you after finding you in that wild scenario? It was completely an anchoring opportunity. In 19, this was the fall of 1998. Uh, they were, of course, as we mentioned, they were a weekend outlet. All they did was Saturday and Sunday. And now they're starting to get into, remember the sports babe, the fabulous sports babe would have her Monday through Friday uh, or late morning show that was getting some traction. Now they were thinking about adding a morning show, which we later would find out would be uh, Mike Golick and Tony Bruno, soon to be Mike Golick and Mike Greenberg. But they were expanding to 24 hours and seven days, and they needed another full-time anchor. They had two or three already on staff, and so they were looking around the country for one, and uh, by much fortune, uh, Len Weiner happened to bump by that studio one day. I went in, did my audition over a three-day period. They invited me back in November of 98 for another three days, did that well. By that point, I just had this gut feeling they were going to offer me a job. Like I started looking for apartments. My good friend Joe Tessator, who I knew from Firebirds days, and another guy who, uh, you know, who's, his mom knew my parents, the whole thing. Joe was working here at Channel 3 in Hartford before his play-by-play -play, uh, took over for boxing and horse racing, et cetera. So he's already telling me, like, here's some places you should look at. Like I was already getting involved in it. And then by Christmas time of 1998, uh, that's when they offered the contract. I put in my two weeks at WKNR in Cleveland. And by early January uh, of 1999, I was already full time at ESPN Radio. I know it's hard to have this perspective, maybe looking back on, look, I'm working at ESPN and that should be good enough for everybody else. But because of when we're taping this in June of 2021, the anchor position in radio has changed because of technology, because of the advancement in sports, where especially to local markets, we may not even hear Anchor hop on the air anymore and give those type of updates like they did in the late 90s. Even though you were hired to be an update anchor, were you hoping to do more at the worldwide leader? Or were you just fine being, you know what, I'm on the air, I got a nice gig, this is fine with me? You know, what's interesting, guys, is when I got there, I wasn't. I thought I had finally bitten off too much and I was way out of my league. I'm working with people who are sports encyclopedists in their brain. Uh, they also do television work. I mean, these were like the creme de la creme. And here I am just, you know, a few years, you know, out of Cleveland and a few years out of college. And I just wasn't sure if I fit. And it was, everything was happening so fast. There were so, so many elements to what I had to do. And the updates were, you know, much more constructed. We were for like five minutes at the top of the hour. We had another three minutes at 20 past, three minutes at 40. I mean, I had headaches. I just wasn't sure if this was going to be for me. And then after a few months, I realized that I could do this, that I was pretty good at it. And I just figured out the, the tips and the tricks to, to get around, you know, having to do so much. And I feel for the anchors today because now not only are the smartphones out there, but, you know, maybe you have 70 seconds at the top of the hour or 80 seconds at the bottom of the hour. And you can't really do what I was able to do. And so my big break came Speaking of, did I want to do more? I didn't realize it at the time, but um, all those years in Gilderland growing up, listening to pregame shows and postgame shows, um, there was a night when the Yankees and Red Sox were playing a Sunday night game, my second year at ESPN Radio, so it would have been the fall of, of 2000, 2000, yeah. Pedro Martinez, I think, struck out 17 Yankees that night. Anyway, back then, <laughs> the baseball on ESPN Radio anchors were all Sports Center anchors, so it was Rich Eisen or Bob Stevens, or Steve Berthume, you know, you name it. Those are the guys who came over to radio, did pregame, did postgame. Rich Eisen, I think, got sick that day or just couldn't. Maybe they had a TV event. And I was on the updates that afternoon, it's Sunday afternoon, leading into Sunday Night Baseball. And so my boss said, hey, we're in a pickle here. Would you have any interest in being the pregame host for Yankees Red Sox? And of course, you know, it wasn't really, can you, it was, will you, you know, you are doing this. So, but in my head, I was like, I didn't think of it as a big break. I just said, I would love to try it. And so the pregame, you know, they kind of dumbed it down for me, but 
I had never really listened to what we did. So it was really this uh, conglomeration of every pregame host I'd ever heard, you know, from Bob Costas on TV to any of the radio hosts. And I just kind of made it up as I as I went along, just trying to survive this night of doing Yankees Red Sox, which to me seemed like a, a very visible night. You know, people all across the country are driving around and listening to this. And I remember uh, my boss's boss got word back to me after that night where he just said, you know, that was great. I would love to use you more. How available are you? Are you interested? And that boss, John Martin, was the one who was involved in all the remote play-by-play -play at ESPN Radio. So I started doing as much pregame as I could, postgame, halftime, college, I don't know if we had college football at the time, but definitely Major League Baseball and NBA. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm working with Brent Musburger, you know, doing pregame for his NBA finals and working with Jim Durham and Dr. Jack Ramsey. Hadn't really met them, but we were working down the line all the time. So in those early years, you know, I had this little gravitas working with these guys and they were really backing me. And, you know, uh, I think Jim Durham was doing a Denver Nuggets game with Dr. Jack and he was taping his pregame with George Carl, who was then the head coach of the Nuggets. And so he asked the producer, Jim Durham does, says, like I do today, who's the studio host? So I can say, you know, Thank you, Kevin Winter. We're here with George Carl. And they said Mark Kestisher. And George was like, this can only be one guy named Mark Kestisher. And George <laughs> is the coach of the Albany Patroons. Patroons, yeah. So he tells Jim Durham and Dr. Jack Ramsey, two Hall of Famers, you know, how much fun he had with me in Albany and broadcasting. And now all of a sudden I, I take on this whole nother level of respect from JD and Dr. Jack. Like we didn't know Kesty was a radio play-by-play -play guy and the Albany Patroons. And so everything kind of, that's kind of a pivot point where for me, I felt like I belong with these guys and, and now they know I did play by play. And, and now I'm, now I'm starting to bug my boss, John Martin, like, how can I get a game? Like, I think I deserve to be in the NBA, which I was not even close to being ready to call an NBA game, but I felt I was. And so within a year, this is about 2004, 2005, uh, the Jimmy V Classic which then we used to just broadcast on ESPNradio.com. This is before apps. And that was when John Martin said, you know what? We're going to throw you a bone. Let's see how you do. And I don't think I was great. There was a ton of constructive criticism. But from that point, they worked with me. They gave me opportunities little by little by little. And then within three years, in 2008, Jim Durham got sick. It was my 40th birthday party. My wife, my mother uh, put together this huge thing here in Connecticut. My mom was going to fly up from Florida and John Martin calls me a day before and says, Jim Durham is sick. He can't get out of Houston. I need you to fly to Detroit right now. You're doing Pistons and Hornets tomorrow at the palace Sunday afternoon. And I'm like, I have a 40th birthday party. Everybody's here. So I told my wife and, you know, she's been the more my moral compass, uh, you know, ever since I met her back in Albany all those years ago, she's like, we'll have the party the next day. People are staying. You, you need to go to Detroit right now pack your bags go to the airport and that was my nba debut and all those years of prep under john martin and others from 2005 to 2008 led me to that opportunity and then it just skyrocketed from there the confidence builds the talent shows as you mentioned even though you had some constructive criticism you had to work on that's fine it's something to motivate you to get better and you continue to capitalize on all these opportunities I want to get to some questions involving, especially for younger broadcasters, how to prep for a broadcast and things like that. I'll close with that in a little bit, but I want to continue on this path here in the NBA because as exciting as it is to call that Pistons game and get on that flight on your 40th birthday and continue to add to your career, there is a time where that evolution, I guess I'll call it, continues because sure enough, you continue to build and build, especially on that NBA side, to the point that you work your way all the way to calling the NBA Finals. It's hard to have these moments of, did I make it? Did I make it? Because we've hit on a few of these. But that moment when it's, you know what? I'm the lead guy. This is the NBA Finals. And I'm sitting courtside. Must have been a moment where you thought, from the days in Gilderland to where I'm sitting right now, it has been one hell of a ride. It's the most ridiculous story ever. For anyone who's listened from the start of this to now, you're like, how did that happen? How did, how did this person get to be the voice of the Finals? Two stories I'll give you. One is... Um, let's see, I took over in 2017. So the 2016 finals, of course, is well remembered for LeBron James and the Cavs coming back down 3-1 against Golden State. And in the midst of that seven game series, I get a call from my boss and he says, congratulations. And I said, for what? He goes, you're going to be the guy. And I said, the guy of what? And he goes, 
you're going to be the guy. He goes, Kevin Calabro, who's a longtime Sonics voice, who'd been our number two. Jim Durham passed away. He became our number one. He didn't go with the Sonics to Oklahoma City. Um, had gotten an offer he basically couldn't refuse from the Portland Trail Blazers. I mean, just a brilliant four-year offer to become the Blazers' voice. So he was leaving us. Uh, Mike Tirico, unbeknownst to me, was about to leave ESPN for NBC, and Tirico was our number two um, and also did the finals. He and Calabro, you know, depending on U.S. Open golf time of year, they would be the finals guys. So these two guys, you want to talk about a career with – Every opportunity that's happened for me that I just described over the last half hour, here's just the latest. I needed two guys who there's no chance in heck would ever leave this ESPN radio gig actually left. And here I am standing with the ball. And not only that, but my boss told me this was game one at Golden State when he said, you're going to be the guy. He goes, but you can't tell anyone, not even your wife, nobody. So I'm so into this finals, which is a great twist and turn finals. Warriors are up three games to one. Draymond Green gets, you know, suspended for game five. Now we're going to game six. Now we're going back for game seven to Golden State. You know, Kyrie hits the shot. LeBron has the chase down block. I completely forget that I'm going to be the guy. Like, you would think that's impossible. But I've buried it so far in my head, in my work, that now I'm at dinner after game seven with a bigger boss at ESPN Radio, who says, congratulations. And I thought he was just congratulating me on a great job studio hosting one of the classic NBA finals. And I said, thank you, it was a great finals. And he goes, no, 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 congratulations on being the new voice of the NBA on ESPN Radio. And I said, oh my God, I completely forgot. <laughs> so that's the first story. The second is traditionally at ESPN Radio, for whatever reason, the lead voice of any particular sport generally doesn't get to finish off the season. You know, John Shambi is the voice of baseball on ESPN Radio. Dan Schulman does the World Series. But prior to him, John Miller did the World Series when Dan Schulman was the voice of the NBA on ESPN Radio. Jim Durham often was our NBA voice, but Brent Musburger would do the finals or Mike Tirico. So long way to say that I just assumed in that first year in 2017 that I would not be doing the finals. I would take it to the conference finals and then I would be the studio guy like I always had been since 2004. Uh, but it was very clear to me before that season started, somebody said, no, you're doing the finals with Hubie Brown. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> and they're like, yeah. So fast forward to uh, June of 2017, the Cavaliers and Warriors at Oracle in Oakland. Kevin Winter is now the studio host. And about 30 seconds before he's tossing to me, you would think I would have that feeling of, Boy, here's this kid from Gilderland who, you know, dropped out of Syracuse, who got to ESPN and had to work his way into the remote department and get a play-by-play -play chance. You'd think that's what I'd be thinking about. Instead, I had this massive pain in my right arm, not the heart attack arm, but I'm just thinking like, I am so nervous I'm about to keel over and die here because he's going to pass it to me in 30 seconds and I'm going to have to call the finals in front of the whole world with a Hall of Famer to my right, Hubie Brown. So it was the first time I, I've never been that nervous before. And I really thought I, uh, I was not going to be able to call the game. And as soon as Kevin tossed it to me, it was just like any other game I'd ever called. The words came out of my mouth. The play is happening in front of you. And instinctively, you just call the game. And I've got everything I need. I've got a Hall of Famer to my right. I've got my best producer to my left. I've got a Gold Star studio team up above. And it was just like it was you know, the, the Pistons and the Hornets in 2008, you know, even though it was game one of the finals. And so that was the big lesson was you can get out ahead of yourself when you get a big opportunity and you really just got to put it in the back of your brain, call it like you would call, um, you know, Albany against Geneseo, you know, in the division three playoffs and everything else will take care of itself. Now, there is a story about that game. I don't want to get to it yet. I want to sit on Hubie Brown first, so let's talk about it. The man is 88 years old. He's going to be 90 in two years. There's my math getting shown off there. He's still doing this. Kesty, how long can Hubie Brown do it? I think he could do it forever at this point. <laughs> and, and on top of that, he had to do it this year in a pandemic situation where we're broadcasting from home. You know, I know, I know, we're loosening up now, but Hubie hasn't been out uh, of his of his house for the entire regular season and the early portion of the postseason. And you know, technology is not easy for me at fifty three. You know, I'm always asking my daughter, like, how, how do I how do I get my laptop configured so I can do this? And so I can't even imagine him at eighty eight. You know, setting up the technology to get on the air 
And then not only that, but for those who haven't had to do a game from home, which is probably, you know, 99% of the world, the platform we use is very Zoom based. And so when you see these camera shots come, it's hard enough to call a game off monitor. I know because I've been calling them off the Bristol monitors all year, which are clean, high def feeds. When you're calling them off a Zoom feed, they're choppy. They're a little grainy. It's tough to see, and yet when you listen to Hubie, it sounds like he's right there. I mean, he just knows basketball. He probably could close his eyes and still uh, analyze it. So, yeah, he's remarkable. All right, now let's go back to that game one because I have this written here. I'm just going to use the same graphic I had before. Do you hate J.R. Smith? Or do you hate <laughs> Levitard? For those who don't know, if they Google your name, unfortunately, J.R. Smith ruined this. Take us through what happened at the end of that game one. And, you know, fortunately, that wasn't my first NBA Finals game because that was 18 was game one. <laughs> That's right. Okay, game. thank you for the timeline. That's right. Okay. Can you imagine? Well, when people find, if they don't already know, I completely messed up the end of regulation in game one. If I had done that in my first NBA Finals game, I don't know if I would have recovered. At least I had one NBA Finals under my belt. And I barely recovered from messing up game one in 2018. So uh, the Cavaliers are up one or down one. I'm already blanking here. They're uh, they're down one. Right. They're down one. So um, George Hill is going to the line, right? Yes. Two free throws for the lead. And he hits the first tie game. He misses the second. J.R. Smith gets an incredible offensive rebound. And really, all he has to do is go up and score to give them the lead. Instead, he dribbles out like they got that they already have the lead, and he grabbed an offensive rebound. And uh, I just totally blacked out in that moment. I was convinced, based on J.R. Smith dribbling out, that they had a one point lead. All I had to do was look up and see 107, 107, whatever the score was. And so that whole sequence where, you know, LeBron makes the motion, pass the ball, shoot the ball. You know, I'm convinced they're up one. So I have probably the worst four seconds of um, major broadcasting of play-by-play -play sports in the history of mankind. Uh, fortunately, I recover. We have a great overtime period. And uh, there are so many people I am indebted to for the rest of my life who are play-by-play -play people who reached out to me and they knew I was hurting. And they were like, look, you got to put this behind you you just have to get back on the horse you will never make that mistake ever again and get on your way and uh, you know it's it's a source of great embarrassment um you know it's probably going to be there on the tombstone when it's all said and done hopefully not but it was a learning lesson that you can make mistakes and move forward um but it's it's hard because i'm a perfectionist and even though i'm i'm far from perfect as an announcer um, anytime things go wrong, I take it hard. And that was a really rough one. I mean, I, I struggled with that for a long time. And I don't bring it up to embarrass you. I bring it up for two reasons. One for that last point there, because some young broadcasters are going to have mistakes and they are going to take their mistake in a minor league baseball game or a summer college league. Like it is the NBA finals. And because you're an adult and you're mature, even though it hits you hard when you're going through your early parts of your career and you make mistakes, it's going to crush some young broadcasters. So to find out that you can still recover from making a mistake from a broadcast is a good learning lesson. And number two, I want to defend you because as much as you take blame for that, you've called thousands of games. Never in that instinct moment are you thinking, okay, it's the NBA Finals at the tie score. A player is going to run and screw it up. It's not because you weren't paying attention to the game. It's not because of something else that happened. It's you've called so many games when you watch a player do that. That's instincts. Like you just thought, okay, the guy has the ball. Something's wrong with the score. I blame J.R. Smith. I don't blame Mark Cast this year. I will defend you for that. It's funny because I've listened to everybody else's call of it, whether it was TV or the two local calls, and you could hear the, I'm not sure if he knows the score or I'm not sure if the scoreboard is right. And I got, here's another learning lesson. I got ahead of myself on that one because that was a huge game from LeBron James. If I'm not mistaken, he had 51 points. They were severe underdogs to the, you know, Kevin Durant added Golden State Warriors who, you know, they're supposed to blow Cleveland off the map in 2018. And this was going to be such a monumentous Cavaliers victory that I was already thinking, how am I going to wrap up this broadcast? How can I make this in a historical sense? Because you get one shot when the buzzer goes. And you don't want to be thinking about it then. You want it to be what you're feeling at the moment. So you have to have a seat or two. And that opened my eyes to 
Just make sure you know the situations. It's more important, you know, time, score, timeouts, fouls to give, just the basic stuff. And everything else will take care of itself. So it was a huge learning lesson on a huge platform that, um, you know, unfortunately didn't go my way. But as many people told me, and they told me great stories. I mean, I heard from a guy who uh, was with the Detroit Tigers who worked with Ernie Harwell. And, and again, none of the stories I got made me feel better about myself because my situation was pretty bad. But he said there was a rain delay at Tiger Stadium. And he was told that the game was done. So he went on the air. And back then, people had their you know radios on in this crowd. And he goes, folks, uh, game's been called. And we'll be back with you tomorrow night. You know, this is it. Tigers Radio Network. Good night. And the stadium gets up and leaves. And it turned out that that was incorrect information. And they started the game up like an hour later. And nobody was there because Ernie Harwell told them the game was over. <laughs> and I've heard from other guys who messed up names or uh, just messed up situations. Brian Anderson told me a great story during the, uh, it might have been uh, a regional final, where there was a shot that he said to tie the game, but it took the lead. And it was, you know, he never makes mistakes. So that was one that lives with him. And again... People don't remember them. I mean, I've met people who, uh, in and around that time, infamously remembered my gaff, and that was how they remembered me. But all these years later now, we're four years later, I find less and less people even remember it. So, it, you know, that's what I was told is like, just move on and just be better. And, uh, and I hope I never make that mistake again. I hope young broadcasters learn from that. And it's just, just be in the present. Don't worry about you know, the great, um, you know, Vin Scully line when Kirk Gibson hits the home run, you know, and in a season of improbable, the impossible has happened. It's like, you know, you just got to hope those words come at the moment. And I think I was just getting a little too cute. Yeah. And when you were going through your career and, and hopefully some broadcasters have those moments and things like that. But when it started off, it was just TV and radio as the ways in which you were going to watch play by play coverage of sporting events. Now with COVID-19 affecting the ways in which, whether it's a YouTube channel or Twitch and all these different ways in which you can watch or listen to games, it does op offer these opportunities for young broadcasters to start as soon as high school doing games. What do you see as the future of play-by-play -play when it comes to broadcasting these games? Yeah, I hope it's we still remain with a, a large scope of traditional play-by-play. -play. Uh, I know I'm becoming a dinosaur as the days and months and years pass, but you're right. I mean, there's... There's so many different, I can't even imagine the platforms, you know, that we're going to have 10 years from now versus what we have now. So I think as it gets younger, the demographics get younger and we're seeing that now you got to find different ways to attract viewers for games uh, that I know um, I have sons and daughters of friends who don't watch games. They love the buildup. They love the hype, but they can't sit down for two and a half hours or are unwilling to sit down for three hours for a baseball game and just watch it from start to finish, which is completely different from, you know, how most of us grew up. So, you know, there's different ways, whether it is, you know, watching it through the lens of somebody else, you know, an influencer, if you will, or a sports influencer, somebody, you know, who, uh, you know, has a different take on the game that you appreciate and you're watching it through a, another party. You know, it's not, it's not really the way that I'm looking that I would want to do it, but maybe, you know, maybe that's something that's out there. Like, you, I, know, I know the video game aspect of it, the different, we can make it look like the video game. I've seen, we've seen other broadcasts where they've kind of graphicked it up a piece, they've loosened it. So it's not such the state play by play and analyst type role. So I think there's just, you know, people who have very clever ideas that will take advantage of platforms that we don't even know about yet, but will just resonate with younger fans. Um, to get them interested in the actual live time of the game from tip off to the end. You know, I think that's the direction play by play will go, but it's going to be, I couldn't even hazard a guess what it's going to look like, but somebody's going to come up with a good idea and then just get in there, do the job that everyone loves. And then all of a sudden we'll have a little copycat. And next thing you know, you've got other play by players of the future who are just doing it a different way. At this point, Mark has to share is not prepping for a game on TikTok quite yet. So, <laughs> Luckily, that's a good thing. Now, just about radio, how about a prep for a broadcast? A classic prep. Best advice you can offer people who are getting ready to call those games. Yeah, I mean, if you're lucky enough to get a week to know it's coming, 
You know, I mean, my prep is always just starts with personnel first. Obviously, football is a bear. You know, you're spending an entire week getting through football personnel. Basketball's a lot easier. NBA is a lot easier because you know most of the players. So now you've got personnel down pat. Now you got to find some interesting stories. If you're doing television, you need like five or six good stories in your back pocket. For radio, I do five or six anyway, and I'm lucky if I get one because it moves so fast. And I want to get my analyst involved. So when there's, if you're a solo broadcaster like many of the local radio uh, teams are, that's when you get those stories in at the free throw line during a, a replay review during a timeout. For me, I want to make sure my analyst has that entire time. So I, I learn personnel. I make sure to have five or six really good stories. Obviously, you want to, uh, the day before, make sure you know all the implications. What's at stake is always the most important thing going into a game. What does winning this game mean? What does losing this game mean? Make sure you repeat those narratives a couple times through the broadcast. Have them handy. And then, I just so happen to have here... Uh, this is my uh, NBA chart from uh, Jazz Grizzlies the other night. It's way loaded than you would ever need. Oh, you know, it's got all kinds of player information and highlighted. So anything I ever need is at my fingertip. So sometimes you can use a, a cheat sheet like that. And I produce those, you know, for every game that I do. So that's part of the prep as well. And then I love to, um, my prep's always been two things other, video and then calling people I know who are around the team all the time, local broadcaster, for example. So Grizzlies, I, I phoned the, the radio voice of the Grizzlies. We had a nice 10, 15 minute conversation just so I make sure I'm on the right path. And the video aspect of it is, and now it's so much easier to get stuff online, but you know, I used to record uh, with the VHS and then the DVR to make sure the two teams that I'm broadcasting, I have watched their complete previous game. And if I'm fortunate enough to have enough time, I could watch the game they played head to head three months earlier. Um, so that way you, you're not, uh, from the network perspective, I'm parachuting in on a game and the people who are listening may be watching them all the time. So, you know, I want to make sure I'm on the same level as those people working in. So that's my prep really is, you know, to, to know personnel, watch video, talk to people and then put together my cheat sheet. And if I could do all that in two or three days, I'm, I'm on a good spot. As the NBA playoffs continue to roll on, make sure you're listening on ESPN Radio to hear that prep work at its full. Mark Kestershire giving you all the action. Now, the podcast is getting there with guys, and we usually close with this question. The best advice to get where you are, if maybe you're a Gilderland High School student and you're hearing this for the first time and you want to follow the footsteps of Mark Kestershire, I have to admit, I ask this question to close every podcast. I feel like your answer is going to be far different than anybody else's because we've heard about your path. I don't think your path exists anymore to be blunt about it. I don't know if you can do it the way you did it anymore. Yeah, I don't even know if I could do it the way right <laughs> the way I did it the first time. But look, I think the one constant for all of us, which includes even me, is if you've identified that this is what you want to do, you know, you got to give yourself a really good chance to go out there and do it. So whether it's finding a good college, doesn't have to be the best college, just a college that has a program. Um, that allows you to get experience. So you are calling games if that's what you want to do, uh, or you're writing about games or whatever it is, you know, find that opportunity. And then once you get there, whether it's through college or maybe college is not for you and you just want to get to work, you know, it's harder and harder now to find those jobs at a radio station where you're doing whatever it is. You may not even be on the air, but you're you're, you're affecting the on-air, you're running the board, you're, you're doing whatever. Just get experience and then use any tool you can. I know the internet's a lot easier now to find out where those jobs are. It's a lot tougher to get those jobs because, you know, broadcast journalism schools are pumping out thousands of kids, you know, every year is to just be willing to take a chance and go anywhere. When I went to Cleveland, you know, I was already 26, but I remember being 21, 22 years old, and I was looking for jobs everywhere. The Albany jobs fell into my lap. Fortunately, I didn't have to leave the capital region, um, but I was ready to go to, you know, Butte, Montana or, you know, Death Valley, California, you name it, wherever. I would go wherever there was a job. So if that's the opportunity for live sports, you know, be willing to eat mac and cheese and, you know, live in an apartment with uh, five roommates if you have to you know, to get out there and get that job. Now, there are jobs now where you can, you know, work online. It's a completely different paradigm. So you might be able to find stuff where you don't have to leave home. You just need a good internet connection. But I think the thing that rings true from 1989 to right now is, you know, if you have the passion, you've identified, just 
try to find a job somewhere, whether it's not what you ultimately want to do, but it might lead to that. Just take it and get the reps. And eventually a door is going to open and just be patient. I know it's hard when you've got to pay bills and you know you may have to, as I did. I worked in a bank down on State Street in downtown Albany, microfilming. This was you know before we could scan. I was microfilming during the day with a microfilm camera, and then I would take the CDTA bus to Heritage Park, and I would do whatever I had to do to be a part of the Albany Yankee broadcasts. So you might have to have a job or two in addition, but just stay with it, keep looking, use those resources, and be willing to go anywhere, and, and hopefully that'll lead eventually uh, to your dream job. Well, thank you for sharing that advice, especially in this time where so many students may have just recently graduated and they're trying to find out ways and they're going to be tested and it's going to be tough even for guys who are calling the NBA Finals on ESPN Radio. It wasn't always easy and there were some tough obstacles on the way to get there. Mark has to share. Kessie, I hope to see you at Saratoga this summer. When you visit the Capital Region, you got my number, so make sure you hit me up. We'll have a good time when you come back to your hometown. Thank you so much for taking this time. I know it's crazy busy. When we get to see your NBA playoff charts, we know it's a busy time for you, but you still carved out time to give the advice and offer your career stories. Thank you so much for doing this. I'm looking forward to talking to you again very soon. Well, thanks for uh, giving me a shout, guys, and I think I will definitely be in Saratoga sometime in August when I finally get some time off, so I'll, I'll make sure to let you know when I'm there. Sounds good.